one first question is, when do you blitz scale? It is actually not in fact that you say, I've got an idea, and I go found, find my, you know, my couple of buddies, and I go blitz scale right away. <laughs> right? That is not actually what you do. <laughs> right? uh, maybe once <laughs> right, out of 1,000 or 10,000. But the question is, uh, what speed you're operating at is partially an, an exercise in judgment and intelligence about what does the competition actually look like? What is the way you're going to win a 10-year game? Because very rarely are these games one-year games. They are usually 10-plus year games. Now, you may have to get ahead of the competition in the next year, and the next year may be super intensive in terms of the way you do it. But uh, what's the way to do that? The, and then the question comes down to is, because if, you, example, you decide to hit the afterburners now, and your, and your business model isn't ready, your company actually isn't ready, that's one of the ways that actually you miss a curve and you die. <laughs> right? So it doesn't mean don't do it, because sometimes you have to do it competitively. But that preparation for it and the judgment of it and the execution of blitzscaling actually really matters. The next trend you'll find is that as you're going through the orders of magnitude of scale, you're generally speaking moving from generalist to specialist. It isn't that you ever get rid of generalists in a company, but when you start with you know, the first five people, they're doing everything. Right? You're buying office supplies. You know, I'm heading out for pizza because the, you know, the other folks are coding. <laughs> so you know, my job is to go get the pizza. Uh, actually, we both did that on occasion. <laughs> right? um, and, so, uh, and so what you do, though, is everyone is actually, in fact, responsible for a number of things. So even if you think about technology stack and say, look, I'm, I'm actually building the technology, you actually even have generalist technologists. Like if you have someone who says, look, all I'm really, really good at is kernel code, well, if you're building an application, that's not going to help you that much. <laughs> right? So you actually, in fact, are looking for, you know, in the early stages, people who are much more generalist, much more flexible, flexible, because you also may be moving around in terms of you know, the classic jargon, although accurate jargon now pivots and everything else. You may be trying to figure out what you're doing, so you need people who will do things they're not comfortable with, learn it quickly, et cetera. But as you scale, you will hire more and more specialists. Specialists at technology, specialists at sales, specialists at management, all these sorts of things. And that, that goes, goes to the third path, which is as you scale, you will move from everyone in the room doing and doing just about anything that needs to be done to, peop so, to people who are, some people who are doing and some people who are both managing and doing, also doing, to, okay, some people are just managing and eventually to executives. And part of what executive is, is actually, in fact, as you get to an executive, your primary function becomes the organization. How do you compose them? How do you have them operate as a team? You know, how do you essentially have um, uh, scaling people up? How do you have onboarding? All the rest of that. It's not like, oh, I, I articulate vision and I stand at the helm and point in the direction. That's usually a pretty useless executive, right? It's actually people who are actually, in fact, working on the organization. And so you'll see that as a pattern. Another one is, is it isn't that you do innovation first and then everything else is this kind of thoughtless scale that it almost never works that way. You actually are, in fact, working to preserve your ability to be innovative as you're scaling the organization. Because there's lots of things that you actually, in fact, need to innovate on. You need to innovate on how you're managing data. You need to innovate on um, kind of like what is your go-to-market and actually how are you transforming the way that you're acquiring customers. Uh, you may be innovating uh, depending on, you know, consumer companies tend to be uh, uh, a lower number of product lines. Enterprise tend to be more. Again, all of these things are heuristics, not rules. But you may be innovating on how that's functioning too. And so you have to both uh, scale while you maintain innovation. You also have, frequently will encounter a choice of are you preserving adaptability or are you doing operational excellence? And uh, part of what business is and kind of theory of capitalism very good at is saying, look, how do you drive your unit cost down? How do you make it more efficient to produce a service, to provide a service, uh, more productivity on the employee? It's kind of a classic Taylor industrial metrics. Those are actually, in fact, still valuable. But part of when you're operating at speed and kind of doing this kind of blitz scale, sometimes you actually make choices on adaptability. You actually have wastage. You actually, in fact, go, that's OK if we actually, in fact, hired way too many people. So for example, uh, one uh, kind of early um, PayPal story, uh, so this is uh, you know, kind of Peter Thiel and Max Lovgen um, uh, kind of co-founders. We were growing at between 2 and 5% of uh, user base and transactions per day. And I presume that most people in this room have good enough math to know how that compounds, <laughs> right? Fast. So we, yes, <laughs> right? 
So uh, that basically meant that we were going in the whole, in the, by the second week, we were going 20,000 uh, customer service, new customer service emails in the whole per week and growing. That led to essentially having, uh, we were only listed in Palo Alto, enough angry customers that they could, uh, they figured out which city we were in. They were dialing uh, extension numbers in the office at random and 24 hours a day you could pick up the phone and talk to an angry customer, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, so when, you, when we're doing, okay, we're dealing with that kind of scale issue because we, the, the product is canning away from us, the way that we dealt this is we weren't going operational excellence. We're like, oh my God, we've got to solve this problem right away. So what we did is we literally flew, um, we decided to build a customer service center in Omaha, and we literally flew out uh, 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 you know, groups of employees to do group interviewing a customer service. So that within two months, we would have a 200 person customer service department running to answer that. We churned out uh, about 70% of those employees within three months because it's churning through because that wasn't, we were not, we were doing the opposite of operational excellence, but we were focused on getting it up and adapting as we were going. And that's a frequent choice that you will make in sales, technology, customer service, et cetera. The sixth one is global reach, which is uh, essentially the fact that as a part of the networked age is that you actually get, you, you're global faster than you, than, than you imagine. So when, for example, when we launched LinkedIn, we had 12 companies in the, it was some of 12, 15, it was some in the countries. It was 12 to 15 countries in the, in the drop down 15. list, 15. And we added them as we got people complaining, my country's not in it, <laughs> right? Uh, that list got long very fast. And what's more, uh, even though, you know, reasonably educated, I came here well, along with many of you, um, uh, like Faroe Islands, I didn't actually really know it was a country, <laughs> right? It was like, remember looking up Faroe Islands? Yeah, I was like, okay. <laughs> So you get, to, you, you get to global reach much faster, right? Capital requirements. You basically cannot blitz scale without heavy available capital. And that comes from one of two mechanisms. That either comes from a good revenue model that you're reinvesting or it comes from capital markets that are essentially uh, flowing. Now, that doesn't mean you can't blitz scale only. Are you capital, capital markets are? Oh, financing. Venture capital, debt. Yeah. Yeah, IPOs. ways of getting money, <laughs> right? Uh, although IPOs are more than that too. Um, and so uh, you have to have capital in order to do that. Now, you can blitz scale even in down markets because it's a relative metric, right? Speed is relative. And so it's just a question of how do you move faster in a networked age than available competition. Yeah, this is a super current debate. And if you look at almost any blogs of VCs right now, there's like a lot of people wringing their, arm, wringing their hands about the environment. And I think this is legitimate. Like it's a very overheated environment. Things are very expensive. Lots of companies are raising big rounds. And so like lots of VCs, you know, including us, like we're starting to get concerned about burn rates. And so then the conversation will be, well, the, the tension is between how much you spend and whether you can go win the market. And so you get in this funny cycle of like trying to win the market, but also not trying to, to increase burn rate, which is how much money you're, you're, you're sending out the door uh, every month. And so it, it's a real tension and it's a very, very current question. Yeah. And Uber, uh, Uber, Lyft, all these guys, everybody who's growing is, is looking at that. And you t it has t balance between unit economics, which is how much money do you make on each, each transaction, or lose on each transaction versus how much money do you spend to go take the market. Yeah, and if your burn rate gets out of control and then the capital, you don't have it on revenue and the capital markets die up, that's another way, which, which in the uh, first internet boom was a way that you had internet winner, right? That's the kind of thing that blows companies up, right? They, so, they yes. So I think that's good enough because we talked about eight and nine. All right. We should go a little more quickly. Yes. So this is a high line of kind of thinking about how, uh, kind of roughly speaking, we'll publish these slides so you don't need to like take the notes on them and so forth, but it's kind of a way of thinking about kind of what happens when you're going between them. And we'll return to these themes as we're going through them. Obviously right now we're in the, the family area. That's great. Okay, so hey everybody. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to give a kind of a brief, I wanted to give some, 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 some meat to the story that just got told about those operational stages or those organizational stages. It's, here's one thing you got to keep in mind as we go through all this stuff. There is no one story. Every single company that's passed through this stuff has passed through many different paths, some of whom would not, wouldn't even find it familiar. We wouldn't recognize it at LinkedIn, but you might recognize it at Workday or wherever. So I'm going to tell a little story about how we pass through these phases for LinkedIn. 
to try to give you an idea of what it actually feels like to be in each place and some of the decisions that we actually made. And hopefully it'll make some of that stuff and we'll actually come back to that list of one through five because a lot of the themes line up really well. At LinkedIn, we were one of those companies that did not blitz scale at the beginning. So basically at the very beginning of the company, we spent two years in phase one, right? Which for a company like Instagram or WhatsApp, Oh yeah, well, I'm not gonna spend too much time on these. You can see sort of the length, the length of it, but it basically it took us a little over 12 years to sort of get where we are right now. Can you go next? And also, right. but this, is what, this is the thing that you're talking about, the two years of yep. figuring it out. From exactly. Like employees, revenue, some other stuff. Yeah, so give me the first, uh, the first picture. So these guys are the original, well, most of the original founding crew of LinkedIn. This was our household back in the day. This is in 2003 and 2004. And basically, we started the whole thing with a single idea. Uh, and I should explain really quickly. You're gonna see a whole bunch of pictures that look like this. Because we got a tradition, starting with this photograph, that when we reached major milestones in terms of user growth, and you'll understand when I'm done with this, why user growth was so important to us, we would take a picture of the people who are working in the company, holding up the number of people who were in the network. So you're gonna see several variations on that during this. Back then, we had a single idea of what we were actually trying to do. We entered, we, we discussed it in 2002, and in 2003 we set out with this idea. If you could build a professional network with reputable relationships inside of it, it would be useful for a thousand different things that professionals actually do on a regular basis. That was the whole theory behind what we were doing. So we made it searchable, and the idea is we would get to a certain number of people, then people would start using it for search on a regular basis, and it would become a new way of doing business. That was basically the idea. Everybody we hired were people we had worked with before. These were all friends or former colleagues. Um, sorry about the notes. Um, <coughs> the organization itself was as lightweight as possible. Literally, we were borrowing the rooms that we took this photograph in, right? And this, uh, and basically we had only the absolute minimum for building out general administrative. We had only... You might wanna tell the story of the whiskey. Uh, if I have time, I'll tell you the story about the whiskey. So. Um, we, we had only the absolute basics for making things happen. So basically all of our effort, every single moment of every day was for solving one problem, which is what's gonna be valuable to the user. That was literally all we thought about and nothing else mattered. We did everything else to the minimum level possible. We released in May of 2003 and we immediately began learning about what product market fit actually meant for us. People familiar with the concept of product market fit in general, just the idea that basically you're providing a product which provides value out into the market at scale. That's basically the idea. We didn't really know, we had a theory, a hypothesis about what the market fit was actually gonna be, but what we found out was that it was different. So we put it out there and it became immediately obvious that recruiters were gonna love it. However, in order to get to that place, we had to build a critical mass of people for those recruiters to search. So we had our first notion of what product market fit actually felt like. But we didn't have is the user base necessary to be able to drive that product market fit. And that was what we discovered during our very first version. It was about discovering that fit. The second version, next. There we are again. You can see the team's a little bit bigger. We had to build this team out because basically we had realized what the product market fit actually was and now we needed to build out the minimal operation necessary for us to actually be able to attack that fit. So you can see these are actually the three co-founders there. I am and Reed, who wore his hair longer back in the day, and Jean-Luc, who's our original head of engineering. Um, basically, um, we uh, found ourselves in a place where we had to go from 12 employees to roughly 30 or 40 employees to be able to support things. We also added a new set of new functions, new things that we didn't have to worry about as a startup. Those were customer service, and we added sales, so the go-to-market components uh, that John mentioned a little bit earlier, and we added minimal GNA, gen, uh, the general administrative functions, to be able to do things like cut paychecks and manage uh, 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 benefits for our employees. So just the minimal stuff that we actually needed to do. Next. Okay, here we are again. Now we're in the parking lot because we no longer fit in the building, mm -hmm. right? 13 million users at this point. Um, I'm way in the back there. Uh, in the village, uh, for us, um, this became a place where we wanted to try to do two things simultaneously. So we wanted to be able to take advantage of the existing fit. That was they build a great recruiter business. But we also needed to explore additional fits. Basically, we had a great fit with recruiters, which only represents about half a percent of all professionals. But we knew we had a value proposition for every professional. 
So the question is, how are you actually going to go out and find that? So in 2007, we broke our organization apart, and we added a ton of extra overhead because we needed to divide our R&D organization up into parts. So we went from one R&D organization to five R&D organizations. Five, five. And, uh, and five, and for what it's worth, we still have five R&D organizations at LinkedIn. That okay. was the tracks, you're referring to tracks. Right? These are tracks, right. Each one had a different track of things they supported. Either they supported the growth of an existing business or they explored new stuff. <coughs> it was our way of trying to balance operational excellence with adaptability. We wanted to make sure we had four of those organizations. Uh, two, one of those organizations focused on growth, one focused on revenue, and the other three focused on what would be valuable, what other product market fits actually existed to continue to allow us to grow. Um, that required new leadership. When you get a company that big, we're now at 120 people. At 120 people, you need a different type of organizational leadership. So we brought in a CEO. The guy's name was Dan Nye. He came from Intuit. And he came in with tremendous knowledge about building enterprise businesses and sales businesses. He had worked on QuickBooks and a bunch of other things for small businesses. He was extremely knowledgeable about that stuff. He came in and put all the effort in to make a sales organization really work because it was our ability to capture that marketplace. But simultaneously, we had to bring in brand new product and engineering leadership to be able to run those, fo those five simultaneous run lines of development. That's one of the things we're going to talk about, I think, a little bit during the class. Because most people in Tilton Valley talk about founder or CEO. I was a founder. I hired a CEO to replace me. Reed was a founder. Hired him to replace him. Then unreplaced himself. Then replaced, it again, replaced himself again as CEO. <laughs> Indecisive. Um, yeah, Reed is totally indecisive. The, um, uh, so I think that r like w knowing who to put in what jobs, and especially the CEO, res with respect to the founders, something we'll talk about through the quarter, I think. All right, so next. All right, the city. So now we're in a totally different parking lot because now we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of employees. In 2009, we basically began blitzscaling. We hadn't really done it up to this point because remember, growth was our main limiter. If we didn't have a big network, we weren't going to be able to drive stuff. So basically, we had to bring all these people in for to us to, to be able to basically take advantage of the growth we had achieved up to that point and continue to drive our efforts in those five product lines. But at that point, there were changing expectations for the way that our customers were using our products. So we had a recruiter product, we had sales product, we had marketing solutions products wide variety of things, and now the bar had to be raised on all of that stuff. We had to have people managing those relationships. We had to have salespeople out there generating new things. A lot of our customer growth was coming from overseas. So now we're beginning to see growth outside the U.S. So we brought in a new CEO to do this. So this is Jeff Wiener, who'll be with us later in the quarter uh, to talk about this process leading from stage four into stage five. Jeff came in, and the very first thing he did was he prepared us to blitz scale. So one of the things we had never done, and this is a great learning for us, is we'd never written down our company culture. We hadn't written down our strategy because we were too small. We didn't have to do that. You'll find, if you haven't worked in a startup, that when you're at a startup, everyone knows everything all the time. But when you're a big company, you have different management and executive leadership needs. So Jeff came in, he wrote all that stuff down, and it's still the way we run the company today. We're 8,500 employees now. Okay? We basically doubled size year over year over year from 2009 to 2014. Okay, um, something else that happened here. As those of you who've worked in a startup which lasts a long time know, when you work on code a code base for more than six years, it becomes full of gunk, okay? We had tremendous technical uh, changes we needed to make to make sure that we had the technical platform necessary to make the thing successful. So we had to change our technology strategy at this point. We had to think about basically building for scale, for flexibility, for developer productivity, a whole bunch of things we'd never considered before because we now had hundreds of developers working on stuff and still had to drive to be able to move quickly. Finally, we had to change our financing strategy at this point. So we had been doing financing. Basically, we became profitable in 2006. Um, but now we were thinking about how do you bring together the capital that you need in order to be able to do things like acquisitions? So not only did we go out for a C round at this time, but we also um, did the IPO in 2011 in order to be able to make sure that we were ready to make necessary acquisitions along the way. Next. Uh, so this is a small group of people. This is in our new San Francisco office. Um, when we've crossed the 300 million, you can see 300 million is back there. We crossed the 300 million mark. This was one of the major changes we saw. Our development organization is now split across many geographies. 
for the first time in the company's history. We now have as many employees working outside the United States as we do inside the United States. Um, we are in 27 different countries. We have major operations in China. We have uh, people spread all around the world making LinkedIn happen. We also have 8,500 employees, more than $2 billion of revenue, and so forth. So again, the set of requirements has actually changed. So this is the, ch this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. This is the LinkedIn story, and we'll have lots more detail as people desire it, and as you want to add later on, because this is a very, very high level d description. But there's no clean path which gets you from one thing to the next. But knowing these changes and how those needs change over time is the main thing that we want to get out of this. So we can talk specifically about some of those things, and we're going to be doing it with every guest who comes in and talks about the stage they're actually at. And the point is not to make this the LinkedIn story, obviously. The point is to give you an illustration of one example of how these companies actually change and what are the things you need to succeed at in order to succeed in building an interesting company. Yep. All right, so uh, 20 more minutes and then we're good. So just quickly, the next two weeks are about the family stage. It's about having a team, small team, trying to find product market fit. And so the things you care about are mostly these. Is your product any good? Does anybody care that your product's good? What, what do you uh, do every day? You. What's yes, that? Other than you. Yeah, and your mom. <laughs> and your mom and your dad. They, they love your product, of course. Um, who do you hire and how the hell do you get them to work for you when they can go work for... Facebook or Dropbox or Hot Startups X or go to Y Combinator and be um, up their own founder? How do you get anybody, not just customers to care, how do you get any employees to care? And then how do you make sure you can pay people? You, anything you want to add here? No. This is it. This is about all you can care about at this stage. Things that are not very relevant, they're kind of key, like who's in charge and how do you have analytics, how do you tell you're doing and strategy. But in truth, you're not going to do any of this stuff because it's not nearly as important as these other things. Product, 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 people, 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 making sure you can pay. That's it. There's nothing yeah. else at this stage. Yeah, one of the key things uh, when you're looking at these different scales is not only which problems do you solve, but which problems do you not solve. Part of the entrepreneurial journey, and that happens even when you're at scales of thousands, is there are fires burning when you're going home. That's fine. You have to know which fires it's okay to go home. <laughs> like, yeah, we can deal with that one next week. <laughs> but that's fine. And which ones you can't. In the family OS1, these are some of the things that are absolutely critical. And if you're not obsessed about them every single day, you are most likely going to fail. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would say the read is probably better than this anybody that, anybody that I know, which is I call it triaging, which is like knowing what to take care of and what to ignore. And when Reed ignores something, he totally ignores it. <laughs> um, so there are things if, if you, I mean, he has this characteristic some of my other partners do, which is if you send the mail and they give a damn about the mail, they'll respond in about 18 seconds. If they don't and they don't respond in 18 seconds, you are, forget it. You're never going to get a response back because it's below the triage line. So I think that the key for this stage is know what's important, and the stuff, I, I tend to be worse at it than read. I tend to say, oh my God, th here's my to-do list. I'd really like to finish these other things that are maybe not totally priority, but like they're unchecked, and I'd really like to check that box. Um, so it's very, very, a little bit Stanford-y in that way. The, um, but read is pretty good at letting fires burn. And yep. letting fires burn is pretty key if there are the right fires. Yeah. Letting the wrong fires burn, obviously, is another fatality. Pretty bad, yes. Yeah. Another fatality, yeah. Um, so Actually, go back yeah. to the other one. For, so... There's a lot of things that all, and this is, there's a ton that fits in the four, everything else. There's a lot of things that go into building a company. You do not pre-solve problems. So for example, it's very rare in the family stage that actually, in fact, your data is going to be key to your success. It's very likely that as you get to the village, maybe even the tribe, the data is going to be essential, <laughs> right? So it shifts, right? Here, who cares, right? I have a basic dashboard. How many people signed up? How many people downloaded the app? Whatever, you know, like fine, fine. Or, or understand your, your exact thing. As you're beginning to get into it, that will move from 10th to second, <laughs> right, or something. And it depends on the exact company and what you're doing. Likewise, you're going to iterate through, like strategy is always important, but the fact is if you're only thinking and talking about your strategy, that's actually not going to play out. Like you need to actually have a, buy, a disposition to getting in the fight, to doing things. That's part of the, if you're not embarrassed by your first product release, you've released too late. Do not, like there are very few product geniuses who just think it and then launch it, and it works. 
<laughs> very, very few. So if you presume you're one of them, it's a high beta strategy. Maybe it'll work, probably won't. <laughs> right, yeah. so. Part of what happens is trying to get anybody to use it is a pretty Herculean effort. You're trying to get the thing to compile and then ship and then at least in the app store and get anyone to use it, you have to do hand-to-hand -hand combat in a lot of ways. Um, once you do that, if it starts to work at all, the system, the the app, the people, and all the users become too big for you to hold in your head, and that's why data starts to become more and more important over time. And, and one, one, great, one great thing that's changed a lot in the last few years, you all are in a much better environment to be able to handle this. And the reason that's true is that so many of the things which are in fact not vital are now things you can get off the shelf. Like for instance, the whole idea of like provisioning of colo is something that we had to do. We were literally in our first office, we were sitting on the box, instead of chairs, we had boxes of hardware that we were gonna take to our colo, okay? <laughs> that no longer happens. Now that problem, which is not an important problem at all, yep. it's a necessary thing, but it's not important, is something you can do just by signing up for Amazon Web Services. So you've got it much better. The good thing is all the things you don't want to focus on, many of you don't have to. The thing is that the things you do have to focus on are still really hard. Yeah, the bad news is everybody else gets to do that too. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you're competing with everybody who has the same thing. Yeah. So. Uh, this is my favorite, my favorite essay about OS1 by guy, Paul Graham, who started Y Combinator. It says, his essay is, Do Things That Don't Scale. And I think you can convince yourself, and so this will be homework for uh, Thursday's class. There will be three things to read, two things by Sam Altman and one by Paul Graham. But this is the essay that I think everybody should pay real attention to. And what he tells is stories about when you're just starting out, like you might have to go grab somebody's phone and install the app for them and then show them how to use it. That's obviously won't scale to even 100 users or 1,000 users, but getting the first user is critical. Getting the second user is critical. And so he thought it was a story about Airbnb doing things that didn't scale when they started. And I don't know if you know, you know any of those stories? I uh, know a lot of the stories. Do you want to tell any of the Airbnb? Like <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, so I mean, um, so for example, one thing is uh, they went door to door in New York to sign up people's uh, they, they identified them off Craigslist, they got in touch with them, and they went and said, you should go post an Airbnb. So the founder showed up and said, hey, this is why you should be listing on my, on my marketplace. They then also began to realize that the trust and quality of the transactions early had a lot to do with, it, do I see a place that I like? So they would pay photographers to go take pictures of those places, right? Those are all kinds of things that the founders were doing at the very beginning. And when you're doing that, you're not writing code, you're not buying marketing, you're not interviewing and hiring people. That's all a bunch of stuff that is actually, in fact, massively time intensive. Now, of course, when you're in the family stage, you will tend to be working, you know, probably casually 100 hours, 120 hours a week, maybe even more, <laughs> right? So that's fine, but uh, it's a choice of how you're putting the time. And those are all things that was necessary to get to the initial critical mass to have a value proposition that people would say, oh yeah, this is actually something I would use. It's critical for so many reasons. It gives you a sense of what actual customers look like and feel like and what they care about. It gives, it does modeling for all the employees. It does modeling for your customers. It does, it, it helps everything. Like doing things that don't scale, like maybe, you're, maybe you will do it later, maybe you won't. Craig Newman, Craig Newmark, uh, you know, did customer service the whole time he was at Craigslist. Um, I think his title is still Chief Customer Service Rep. Yeah. Um, so some people like doing that forever, um, but it's critical, oh. critical at the beginning. So we'll, we'll have you read that. Um, you know, I just want, this is Mozilla and this is my story. Like I, I got there sort of right when the orange started to obviously highly correlated with uh, <laughs> winning. <laughs> Taking um, personal responsibility. Totally causal. <laughs> the, um, no, so I, all I wanted to say is like, look, this is, this story is you're going to see it again and again, which is people kind of off to the left, kind of wandering around trying to make a thing that they think is important. Um, and then you start to get a little bit of traction. Some people care. And then you, far, you start to figure a thing out. In this case, they figured out how to build a quick, fast web browser right at the right time when IE, Internet Explorer, none of you probably use anymore, um, really started to not be very good. And so they, they were building asset, building asset, building asset, and then the context happened that they could blitz scale. And I was employed 12 or 15 right at the beginning there, but it was right at the beginning of us blitz scaling. And we got to be about 400 million users in over the next three or four years. But um, uh, anyways, but we're going to see chart after chart that looks like this, which is slow, 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 fast. Yeah. Um, I actually go back for just a second, because yeah. this is the thing to actually really pay attention to. This isn't just a compounding graph. There's organization, uh, uncertainty, the fog of what's going on in the market, all the rest that goes into this. And that's part of what you meant by decisioning on when are you trying to hit the accelerator. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if they had tried to hit the accelerator any other t any other time, yeah. it wouldn't. It just wouldn't have worked. They would have spent yeah. money, and they would have, wouldn't have wouldn't have happened. Hitting the accelerator then was a profoundly uncomfortable thing. And one of the things is when you're starting to blitz scale, it's uncomfortable all the time. You can't. You're not doing anything yeah. well except just trying to keep the wheels or the wings on the plane. I guess is the yeah. metaphor I'd use. But they all, the, all these charts look the same. Here's Airbnb. Airbnb had a long period over here on the left of the graph before 2010. It was just flat. And again, they were building assets. They were creating momentum, creating a community, so that by 2011, when conditions started to get right, it started to work really well.